Buon pomeriggio e benvenuti al Macro, grazie di essere qui, numerosi. Come sapete siamo al primo incontro off importante, l'anteprima del Festival di Massenzio di letteratura eh, che comincerà poi il 4 giugno alla Basilica di Massenzio, però il privilegio di avere con noi un autore bravo, importante come Anthony Doer era imperdibile e quindi approfittando della bellissima ospitalità del macro silo diretto da Giorgio De Finis che ringrazio abbiamo organizzato questa preview, questa anteprima con lui eh, che ci offrirà il primo breve racconto inedito di questa edizione di eh, Anthony Doer e Roma ospite dell'American Academy e dobbiamo a questa prestigiosa istituzione culturale della nostra città il privilegio di averlo potuto incontrare e coinvolgere nel nostro programma. Ascolteremo l'introduzione che farà l'autore e il direttore dell'American Academy, John Oxendorf, che parlerà subito dopo di me. Intanto io li voglio ringraziare. C'è poi anche un'altra bellissima coincidenza. Anthony Doer è pubblicato in Italia dalla casa editrice Rizzoli ed è uno degli autori più importanti della prestigiosa, della importante collana Burr Rizzoli, che ha avuto un ruolo veramente centrale nella crescita e nella diffusione culturale nel nostro paese. Questa collana editoriale compie 70 anni. E qui con noi Federica Magro, che ne è la direttrice, grazie. <applausi> eh, prima di dare la parola a John Oxendorf, come? Ah, bene. Prima di dare la parola a John Oxendorf vi dico alcune brevissime cose su Doer e sul percorso eh, che ha avuto nell'editoria, cioè nel, ecco, questi sono i tre libri pubblicati in lingua, tradotti in lingua italiana e pubblicati da Rizzoli e che sono nella collana Burr. E, come sempre succede con i percorsi delle traduzioni il più recente è la raccolta di racconti il collezionista di conchiglie è stato pubblicato nel 2017 in realtà è il suo libro d'esordio del 2002 e vedremo come ci, ci siano già in questi racconti dei temi che lui poi riprende nei due romanzi successivi il secondo romanzo l'ha pubblicato About Grace è stato scritto e pubblicato nel 2004, tradotto in Italia nel 2016 eh, ed è un romanzo speciale che diciamo già i racconti sono stati un esordio formidabile e la sua scrittura è stata apprezzata tantissimo dalla critica e dai lettori ma questo sentimento si è rafforzato con About Grace eh, e ancora di più con il secondo romanzo eh, di, degli anni successivi eh, che è quello che, con cui ha vinto il premio Pulitzer tutta la luce che non avremo non vediamo tutta la luce scusatemi tutta la luce che non vediamo ero incerta se darvi il titolo in inglese o in italiano e l'ho storpiato comunque con questo secondo romanzo Anthony Doer raggiunge un grandissimo successo è in testa alle classifiche di vendite per circa un anno nel suo paese in America ed ha eh, finalista al National Book Award e soprattutto nel 2015 ha vinto il premio Pulitzer per la narrativa. Sentiremo da lui cosa sta scrivendo ora e cosa ci attende da questo bravissimo scrittore. La, quello che si deve dire è che a Roma già da qualche settimana, ripartirà domenica prossima, c'è anche la sua famiglia con lui, in America vive in Haidao e ha due figli che sono qui in sala con lui che salutiamo insieme all'autore io lo ringrazio moltissimo invito John Oxendorf a introdurlo al podio magari John che dici? sei più importante lì vai vai sì 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 siamo davvero molto felici di collaborare an ancora con la casa della letteratura e con la sua direttrice e nostra advisor all'Accademia Americana Maria Ida Gaeta. Che è alla diciottesima edizione del Festival da lei ideato e che come ogni anno si tiene alla Basilica di Massenzio. Incoraggio tutti a partecipare fra il 4 giugno e il 3 luglio. 
anche a Borri Zolli, a cui do il benvenuto eh, qui questa sera, editore italiano di Anthony Doerr. Vanno i nostri auguri in occasione del settantesimo anniversario della casa editrice. Infine lasciate che ringrazio il presidente dell'Accademia Americana, Mark Robbins, che per questo evento ci ha voluto raggiungere da New York e anche altri nostri collaboratori come Peter Benson Miller, nostro Arts Director, e tutti i membri della nostra comunità, in speciale special modo i borsisti in letteratura che vedo qui in sala. Grazie a tutti per la vostra presenza stasera. Now you will all be grateful that I'm going to pass to English <laughs> to tell you more about this remarkable writer who we are celebrating tonight and who we will hear from tonight. Anthony Doerr majored in history at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. He earned his MFA from Bowling Green State University, and he came to the American Academy in Rome as a fellow in literature in 2005. At that time, writers did not apply, but they received a letter in the mail saying, congratulations, you're moving to Rome for a year. And I believe this letter arrived pretty much the same day their two twin sons arrived, and so, um, that made for an extra special letter. And we're very glad they didn't tear it up and throw it in the trash. Um, and we're thrilled, of course, to celebrate his book, Four Seasons in Rome, which he wrote about that experience living here in Rome. And this year, he's back at the American Academy as a writer in residence uh, here this spring. As Maria Ida presented, he's uh, written five books, um, and his novels about grace, and in particular, the acclaim he received for his second novel, All the Light We Cannot See, which today we're, we're uh, he's always launching the Italian version, which we're very uh, pleased to help support, won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2015, and was a finalist for the National Book Award. On a personal note, I know many of you in the audience were also kept up very late at night by this book, and uh, it was very difficult to, to uh, stop reading it, and I think I read it in 72 hours that I didn't have to spare at that time in my life, but obviously it, I, I had it and I needed it. On a personal note, when you've looked up to someone for a long time and you know them as Anthony Doerr and you think of them as a a recluse somewhere in the mountains of Idaho producing brilliant literature. And I even, I went to Idaho three times thinking I'd you know, run into him, but uh, I'm thrilled to be able to, um, to welcome him home to Rome and to say what a pleasant surprise that Anthony is not a recluse. He is an incredibly warm human being. Uh, he's actually Tony, may I call you Tony? And, um, and uh, He's been an absolutely fabulous member of our community these last weeks, so we're thrilled to have him in Rome. And please join me in welcoming home to Rome our very own Tony Dorr. Oh, buonasera. Ciao tutti, grazie. That's all my Italian. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks, first of all, to Macro. This is the reddest room. My sons are telling me it's orange. It is tanto rosso, this room. It's beautiful. Thanks to Giorgio for having us. It's wonderful that you allow literature into a space. Mixing the arts is the most important thing. That's something that happens at the American Academy, too. Thanks to Maria. She is a force for readers and writers and has been, at least since I first came here in 2004. She really helps protect and promote reading and writing, which is uh, very important and dear to my heart. Thanks to everyone at Rizzoli, a lovely eternal publisher in Italy, uh, Federica, Luisa, Cristina, Patrizia, everybody else I forgot to mention, and happy 70th birthday to BUR. It's pretty great. I think it's the oldest paperback imprint in Italy, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, and thanks for publishing some of my books that don't sell so many copies, too. That's a nice thing. <laughs> 
Uh, and thanks to the, I think those of you who are listening to a live translation, you're listening to Marina in the back. Grazie, Marina. She's a wonderful English speaker, and that is not an easy job, simultaneous translation. Most of all, I want to thank the American Academy, Peter and Lynn and John and Mark and everybody else, particularly the fellows. It is an incredible, blessed place. Those of you who are fellows there right now, I'm sure, are starting to feel the clock. It's like the end of life mortality ticking to the time that you get expelled and the new group comes in and spring is coming and it's this strange feeling as the jasmine blooms that you know your time is expiring. It is a really, really, really special and unique place. Take advantage of every moment you have there with that library and that light. Okay, I'm gonna read a little essay. It won't take very long and then I'm have a conversation with Maria and I'm more than happy to take questions. You guys hear me okay? Okay, I'll just introduce the essay very quickly. Uh, yesterday, an American deep sea diver set a world record. He did the deepest solo dive in history to the bottom of Challenger Deep. That's at the bottom of Marianas Trench. And that is 6.8 miles under the surface. That's 11 kilometers under the surface of the ocean. Do you know what he discovered there? Plastic. He's found a plastic bag and candy wrappers down there, 6.8 miles down. Eight million tons of plastic enter our oceans every year. Uh, and if we keep doing that, there's going to be more plastic than fish in our oceans by the year 2050. The day before yesterday, when the diver set that dive, uh, the world's atmosphere passed uh, 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide. It's the most carbon uh, dioxide we've had in our atmosphere since the Pliocene period. That's three million years ago. Three million years ago, in the Pliocene, the oceans were 90 feet higher than they are now. That's 27 meters. And a week ago, just seven days ago, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity uh, and Ecosystem Services that work for the UN, they released a report. A hundred countries collaborated on this report. It took them th three years to make it, and they found that we're, uh, about a million plant and animal species are in danger of coming extinct on our planet in the next uh, couple decades, some in the next decade. This is the world my kids are growing up in, and they're often exposed to narratives of dystopias. Dystopias talking about the end of the world from superhero movies on down. We're always faced with images of our world imploding, which made me wonder what kind of utopian narratives are left and what kind of utopian narratives can we tell? And that's kind of been my project for several years now, what I've been working on more intensively at the Academy. So since Maria asked me to talk about the future of the classics, for the past few months I've been thinking and looking about what kind of utopian narratives were there in the past, and it's been, it's been super interesting, it's been fascinating. What can we learn from the classics to help us deal with the future? Uh, and you know, I'm sure you may know the word utopia didn't really arise until Thomas More in 1516. The word utopia means nowhere, no place. But there are many, you know, of course there's utopias of time and place. Utopia of, of time is like make America great again, right? You're longing for some golden age that maybe never existed. And then utopia of place is some distant place. And the Greeks played around with these things all the time even though they didn't use the word utopia. As far back as the 8th century, B.C. Hesiod had this great nostalgia for the Golden Age. It was kind of a make Greece great again feeling. Uh, I'll just read you a few quotes. When men lived like gods with carefree heart, free and apart from trouble and pain, he wrote. When, when the fertile earth produced fruit by itself. Utopias are almost always linked with food. To the kingdom of the Phaeacians, many of you probably know this bit, but I'll just read you a little bit. Tall, heavily laden trees grow their pear, pomegranate, and apple, rich in glossy fruit, sweet figs, and dense olives. The fruit never rots or fails, winter or summer, it lasts all year. And the west wind's breath quickens some to life and ripens others, pear on pear, apple on apple, cluster on cluster of grapes, and fig on fig. There is a fertile vineyard, too, with a warm patch of level ground in one part set aside for drying the grapes while the laborers gather and tread others, because you have to have wine in your utopia, always have wine. 
as the foremost rows of unripe grapes shed their blossom, the others become tinged with purple. So there's no season, there's no hard winters, there's always food, it's very important. Then of course, Plato shows up 500 plus years later and writes The Republic, written at a time of social disintegration, questioning the power of Pericles' democracy, which maybe sounds familiar to some Americans here in the room. He proposes this state run by philosopher rulers. I'm sure many of you know it. But I'm most drawn, I find myself most drawn to the fictional utopias, the stories, and the utopias of escape. And surprising to me was that the Greeks wrote a lot of utopian stories. Many of them are lost. But between about the 4th and the 2nd centuries BCE, there's lots and lots of stories about journeys to fantastic utopias. And lots of these were islands. There's, of course, Cloud Cuckoo Land and Aristophanes the Birds. Maybe some of you know it. There's the City of the Sun by this guy Iambulus. For example, he tells a story about a mythic place where the sea tastes sweet, like you're drinking coke right out of the ocean, where disease is absent, where very tall people live very long lives, have flexible bones, they tend creatures whose blood has magical healing properties, and of course, they never have to work. In these stories, almost all the utopias are islands. And I thought I'd read a, an essay, uh, I thought I'd put together this essay for this event about a journey of my own when I was a teenager, my son's age now, at 14, to my own edge of the world and my own island, and, and then we'll have our discussion. Uh, so just so you know, this journey that I'm about to describe is to a place in Alaska called Kuyu Island. I was 14 years old. Kuyu Island is 750 square miles, that's a, almost 2,000 square kilometers. That's nine times bigger than Elba in Tuscany, and that's 42 times bigger than Ischia. The population of Ischia is 60,000, about 60,000 people. The population of Elba is about 32,000. The population of Kuyu Island in Alaska, 10, 10 people. Okay, you with me? Are you still doing okay out there? All right, all right. Okay, it's called Homesick at the Outer Edge of the World. Is it going to scroll? Oh, yeah, amazing. Look at that. Should I go as slow as that? I like it. Okay. For a period of my childhood, somewhere between years eight and nine, and immediately after I read The Call of the Wild, I decided I needed to become a mail carrier in the Yukon. I would brave blizzards, pan for gold, never clean my room, and communicate telepathically with my sled dogs. For a week that January, I slept with my bedroom window open to prepare my body for the cold until Dad figured out why the house was freezing and put an end to that. I soon moved on to other dreams, NFL punt returner, myrmecologist, restaurant reviewer who only reviews turkey sandwiches but the pull of the north never left. Perhaps it was because I grew up in Cleveland, where trekking north on a dog sled would only get me as far as Willoughby, birthplace of Tim Conway. But Alaska loomed mythic in my imagination. It was a place where the sun never set, where auroras sent green curtains as big as cities flapping through the sky, a place as far from the familiar as you could get. Adolescence compounded things. Nowadays, I appreciate Cleveland's leafy, bygone beauty. But as a teenager, all I saw were dark Februaries, dead steel mills, and freeways leading elsewhere. I became so enamored with leaving home that I papered my bedroom walls with maps of distant islands and asked my parents questions like, you mean you were alive at the same time as Jimi Hendrix and you never tried to see him once? In the spring of my 14th year, I announced that as soon as summer vacation arrived, I would buy a van with my lawn mowing earnings and drive to the Arctic Circle. My mother, half amused, half horrified, pointed out that I couldn't obtain a driver's license for two more years. Then she stuck a catalog for a summer outdoor leadership school beside my breakfast. They offered three trips in Alaska. I jabbed my finger at the least scary looking a month-long sea kayaking expedition. Mom said, you have to be 16 for that one. Oh, I said, and rustled the newspaper classifieds. Look, here's a minivan for sale, 500 bucks. Fine, she said, we'll tell them you're 16, but no vans. 
Two months later, I was standing in the rain wearing two pairs of polypropylene underwear and a life preserver. Ahead of me loomed the bright green fjords of the Tongass National Forest, 70 million acres, the largest national forest in the United States. 15 of us departed in 11 kayaks, and we didn't set foot indoors for a month. Those first days younger than everybody else, collecting drinking water from creeks and bogs and using rocks and moss as toilet paper, I worried I might have traveled a bit too far from the familiar. In Cleveland, we had beds, we had hot water, we had a vacuum cleaner. What I missed most was food. On our first day, we were divided into three-person tent groups, and each threesome had to pack, protect, and cook its own meals. My tent group was particularly unskilled at food preparation. With our little backpacking stove, we managed to burn every supper. Brown rice, lentils, spaghetti, even instant potatoes. Every meal we tried to cook tasted like some variation of burnt noodles. The chocolate we were supposed to ration was gone after the first two nights. We left a, a two-pound bag of pancake mix uncovered during a rainstorm. I started eating ramen noodles raw just so they wouldn't take on the burned taste of our pot. My notebook filled with lists, Doritos, pizza, cheesesteaks. I had hallucinations about my mother's toffee bars. By week two, all my tent group had left that remotely resembled dessert were two 12-ounce bags of Just Add Water brownie mix. We cooked our first batch by mixing up the batter in our frying pan, putting on the lid, and burying the whole thing in hot embers. After 20 minutes, the top and bottom were carbonized, and the center was raw, still ambrosia. We jammed our second bag of brownie mix into the stern of a kayak where it would be safe from bears and rain, and we pledged not to touch it for another week. Then the weather turned. Stranded in an isolated inlet called Port Malmesbury on Kuyu Island, population 10, we had rain and more rain and high seas. I caught a fever and couldn't get warm. I was tired of being wet all the time and hearing the big waves pound the rocks and not eating potato chips. And the tendrils of homesickness wrap themselves around my heart. As dark times go, of course, this was fairly light. Our instructors carried a satellite phone in case things got truly dangerous. I had two functioning parents who would meet me at the airport when I got home. And among my memories from that month are glories, a humpback whale passing directly beneath my boat, its huge shadow sliding along for what might have been 10 full seconds, a galaxy of bubbles rising past the hull. I paddled up a stream so thick with salmon that the blades of my paddle knocked into them. Bald eagles nested above our tent. Glaciers gleamed between the high peaks like faraway kingdoms. But when you're 14 and shivering and your sleeping bag is soggy and your drinking water is brown, relatively non-dire things can feel dire. <laughs> Homesickness is an ailment of the stomach as much as of the mind. In the 4th century BCE, with Athenian society in crisis, the ancient Greeks started a new genre of writing, where they imagined fabulous places, often islands, at the outer edges of the world where everybody was happy. Almost all of their utopias featured food. Here's the poet Telecletes, of whose work only a very few fragments remain. So this is maybe 440 BCE, something like that. Every torrent flowed with wine. Barley cakes strove with wheat loaves for men's lips, beseeching that they be swallowed if men loved the whitest. Just the lust for white flour is very interesting to me there. Fishes would come to the house and bake themselves, then serve themselves on the tables. A river of broth, whirling hot slices of meat, would flow by the couches. Conduits full of piquant sauces for the meat were close at hand for the asking, so that there was plenty for moistening a mouthful and swallowing it tender. On dishes there would be honey cakes all sprinkled with spices, and roast thrushes served up with milk cakes were flying into the gullet. I love it. You don't even have to move. You just open your mouth. 
That afternoon at Port, at Port Malmesbury, sensing I was sinking, one of my tent mates pulled on her rain gear and crawled into her sea kayak and dug out our last bag of brownie mix. The wood was too wet to make a fire, and we were too worn out to try to light the stove, so we sat in our tent, upended the whole bag into our cook pot, poured in a bit of water, and stirred. It is no exaggeration to suggest that when I per put that first fingerful of raw brownie batter into my mouth, the chemistry of my entire body changed. Sugar, what humans won't do for it? I think of prehistoric men climbing trees to raid beehives. I think of the white gold that drove the transatlantic slave trade. I think of childhood and what it meant to walk in from a hard day's play to a kitchen full of color and calories and find my mother making something sweet. I've heard that a parent's greatest joy in life is watching one's, teenager, one, one's teenagers grow up to have teenagers. My own twin sons are 14 as I write this, and they listen to J. Cole and Tyler the Creator and think Jimi Hendrix was roughly contemporaneous with Mozart. And every day they give me some inkling of what I put my mother through. When my boys were little, we used to make brownies from a box every couple of weeks. We'd sit on the floor of the kitchen, take out a bowl and spoon, tear open a box of brownie mix, and start stirring. Tonight, they sit upstairs playing a video game called Fortnite. Dinner is over, the dishes are done, in a month, Henry will leave on a wilderness trip of his own to Yellowstone, and we won't see him for two weeks. I preheat the oven. From the pantry, I take a box of Duncan Hines Chewy Fudge Family Style Brownie Mix and stir it up. Then I walk to the stairs and call up, I'm making brownies. Fortnite sounds drift down the stairs, guns fire, smack talk. Anybody want to lick the bowl? Uh, that's okay, Dad, comes the call back down. More for me, I say, though of course the heart fractures a little. The evolutionary reason for adolescence apparently is to build a functional independent adult. It's healthy for teenagers to try to separate from their parents, to tr critique their clothes, their dance moves, their city. And so we watch them inch out along the tightrope, doing their damnedest to rebel, to rebel and conform at the same time. I sit on the bottom stair and swipe a finger through the brownie batter. As soon as it touches my tongue, time and space collapse. Trees drip, waves crash. I taste that adolescent longing to be elsewhere, pinioned against a craving for the comforts of home. That's it, thanks. E la, nei tuoi romanzi, nei tuoi testi, la descrizione dei personaggi segue alcune direzioni Leggendo i tuoi racconti, che sono stati il tuo esordio, dopo aver letto i tuoi romanzi, vedo che certe impostazioni, certi temi c'erano già. Allora, mi sembra centrale il fatto che, dimmi se sbaglio, eh, eh, per raccontare eh, questi per tuoi personaggi, per te è fondamentale descrivere la relazione tra il mondo esterno in cui loro sono, si trovano a vivere la loro interiorità, e questo sarebbe anche molto banale la letteratura, però mi sembra che tu ogni volta eh, ci vuoi anche dire che mh, molto poco, il loro destino dipende molto poco dalla loro volontà, e molto di più da questo incastro. È così o...? Uh, I mean, for, for me that's... It's not a platitude, that, that's what literature is. Um, Literature is about having this magic power to use language to echo interiority and exteriority. It's an advantage we have over maybe every art form, maybe, because certainly filmmaking, it's much more challenging for a filmmaker to try to um, echo the patterns and the syntax of thought, uh, but we can. We can use smell and sound and texture to evoke the outer world, but we can also use 
uh, with, with just hitting a colon or a comma, we can dive inside of a, a character's mind, inside of a narrator's mind. It's intoxicating and really, really fun to play with. It's really important not to give your reader whiplash as you move uh, from internal and exterior moments, but that, that's kind of what it's all about. That said, occasionally a, a novelist or a short story writer can get a little lazy uh, because it's quite easy to say uh, she was tired or she was frustrating, but to evoke the world that's uh, the way the world looks when a character is tired, when one specific woman is tired, when um, what the world looks like when she's in love, you know, the, the whole tenor of a sunny day in Rome changes if your husband has just died or you're in love. And how do you describe Rome, the external world, to mimic? to reflect that interior world. And, and that's something that's extremely challenging but extremely fun. It's what you kind of think about all day when you're writing, you're solving that problem of echoing consciousness through description, whether you're writing in short stories or novels. For me, I think there's, there's kind of a, at least a fallacy that you use short stories as kind of a stepping stone towards the novel, as if you're learning how to write a novel through writing short stories. But I really think they're quite radically different forms. Um, a short story allows, uh, because of its compression, it allows you to maybe take more risks, but a novel, because of its expansiveness, allows you to do more things. Your reader doesn't have to finish it in a single sitting, so you can spend more time building a world or describing a house or just developing one of your uh, secondary characters. The spatial compression of a short story puts a lot of demands on the space. Ti dà più possibilità il romanzo senz'altro, però quello che l'impressione che ho anche è che questi tuoi personaggi siano un po' ehm, deprivati della possibilità di cambiare la loro vita, cioè tu li descrivi i momenti in cui le cose vanno come devono andare a prescindere dalla loro volontà. Mi sembra che sei molto attratto da questa dimensione della vita. Yeah, wow, we're getting into it. That's free will, right? That's like what we're talking about. It's a very good question. Uh, I mean, this book in some ways kind of explores that in, in many different ways. What is predestination? What is fate? What, you know, what things are prefigured in your life? And, and in some ways this does as well. This is set during the Second World War and the circumstances of history are sweeping characters along and there's many things in their lives they lose control over. Both this book is about two kids who just want to learn, who just have intellectual curiosity in the the events of history conspire to prevent them from chasing their curiosities. That said, I think I like to see characters pushed uh, to a certain limit, buffeted about, like Odysseus, like if we're going back to the classics, who's kind of you know, buffeted from island to island, a disaster from dis to disaster, but eventually who are able to find some kind of agency in their own uh, their own will. In fact, that's often, I think, even in my stories, that's often the moment that the story turns, is that a, a character finally finds some way for him or her to find a little bit of agency. <laughs> but I'm also obsessed with these larger scales of time. You know, we are living on a planet that's four and a half billion years old, and that is incomprehensible to us. Our minds are not evolved to comprehend numbers that large. And so, Somehow, through storytelling, if I can also remind a, a reader that there are larger scales than just a human life, the scales of geology, the scales of you know, species rising and falling. Uh, you know, in this book I have a character tell the young girl, you know, 99.9% .9 of species that have ever lived on Earth have gone extinct. So why would we ever think that we're going to be different or exceptional? So asking questions about human exceptionality and what, what we are, that's also a way of playing with fate and uh, reminding us that instead of feeling small and making ourselves feel puny, I think it's an absolute blessing. It's just an incredible thing that we got to be alive. If we're lucky, we get to be alive for 80 years on this earth. In fact, in your formation university, there is also a period in which you have studied history for a long time. E c'è anche una relazione molto forte con i classici della letteratura. Quindi questa collocazione nel tempo delle, nostre, delle tue storie nasce anche da lì probabilmente. Ci vuoi dire, a proposito di classici, quali sono gli autori che fanno parte della tua formazione? Sì, sì. 
Uh, can everybody else hear that translation? No. Uh, she's asking about literary influences and uh, you know, what books helped me develop a sense of time. I did study history in college, but my mo mother was a science teacher. And so we were the kids, the nerdy kids in the neighborhood who knew the Latin names of the insects we would catch. And she would quiz us on like, if we find a seashell on a vacation, she'd be like, well, that's a mollusk, not an echinoderm, you know, that kind of stuff. It was quite useful. And so in many ways, I was not encouraged not to think, um, just the way Italian kids before they go to high school have to choose a track. I was encouraged that the idea of having a science building on one end of a university and an arts building on the other was artificial, that they were both both ways of uh, investigating what it meant to be alive, to be a human being on Earth. And so I was always reading across disciplines. Uh, you know, at the beginning, the, if, if you want to go all the way back, the first books that really impacted me, my mom read us the books by C.S. Lewis called The Chronicles of Narnia. Does anybody remember these books? And I kept asking her, how, does, how, how do they do this? How did they make this wardrobe and invent this world? And she said, well, it was just one person, and he's dead. And that just, it really, you know, when you're that little, you think books grow on trees. You don't realize that people actually make them. And then you start thinking, well, he's dead, and yet his voice lives on. Or Anne Frank's voice still lives in the words that she wrote in her diary, even though she's been exterminated. There's something so powerful that, about that as a young person, to use these really inexpensive tools, words, language, to uh, bring back voices. You know, books are really the repositories of human memory. Uh, and that's something that I could not articulate at age nine or 10, but I learned from C.S. Lewis and then learned as you start to get a little older, reading Anne Frank. Then I fell in love with the Beats, Jack Kerouac, and On the Road, it was a great kind of adolescent phase to be in. It's about movement and jazz and breaking syntax and the boundaries of sentences. And then as I got older, you know, you're, maybe you're taught Virginia Woolf in high school, but I wasn't old enough to understand how amazing she was. So then you start revisiting some of these books. And then when I was maybe, let's see, I was 22, uh, I was just out of college, I went to New Zealand for seven months, and I only brought $3,000 and traveled around the country with a friend. And the only book I brought was a 2,200-page look at those onion skin pages. It was a book called The Story and Its Writer, and it had like a, every classic short story written in the 20th century all around the world, from like Chinua Achebe to, I don't know, help me out, Bennett, like ZZ Packer, or whatever's in the Zs. And it was just an incredible education. I didn't have a smartphone, they didn't exist. I just was, in rained a lot. You're just in your tent, and you're like, I'm gonna read. Now I'm in the Bs, I'm reading James Baldwin. And you know, now I'm in the seas, reading Carver. So it's an incredible uh, education, I think, for okay. me. It was bringing that book with me. Sometimes the right book finds you at the right time. Possiamo considerare un classico, un libro che continua a dire quello che ha da dire nel tempo? Mi sembra che ci... sì. è la dimensione del tempo che definisce la classicità di un testo. Da quello che mi dici, penso che ti trovi in questo... Senti, cosa stai scrivendo ora? Adesso non voglio anticipare, magari ci sono... Eh, abbiamo stimolato qualche domanda dal pubblico sui temi che abbiamo già trattato. Non so quanti dei presenti hanno letto il tuo ultimo romanzo eh, un po di, è di un po' di anni fa sapere eh, se stai, cosa stai scrivendo in queste settimane all'American Academy cosa hai fatto hai lavorato anche un po' al tuo, per il tuo prossimo romanzo o sono di nuovo racconti sì sì uh, so for the English speakers here uh, it's kind of two part question and my definition of classics is certainly what endures but I also want to remind everybody that there are people out there determining what endures and often in history those have been white males and it's really important to remember that voices have been erased over time. Sometimes it's just you know, impersonal forces of time, a book rots, a book isn't recopied, but at other times, you know, something's considered pagan, something's, somebody's not taught to write. So many voices were never even enabled to tell their story. So yes, uh, endurance is important, but 
there are, uh, there, it's so important to keep recognizing that there are voices that have been subdued or silenced over the centuries, over the past decades, even still now, and that those books have just as much potential to be classics. What they need are champions. They need people who are prominent in the culture to champion those books so that they have the chance. That's the future of the classics. And your second question was about uh, what I'm working on now. Yeah, I've had the incredible opportunity to be here for three weeks uh, without my family just working nonstop. And for maybe three years now, I've been working on a novel since All the Light came out. Uh, it's set in the past, the present, and in the future. I have one character operating in the future, which is <laughs> it's just very uh, anxiety producing because everything feels like a science fiction novel, but I'm trying, I'm trying very hard. And it's about a text, an invented text a lost Greek novel, like I was describing, while I'm inventing the whole thing, and it's being read by a character in each of these time periods, and they're connected by this text. Uh, so there's a book within the book, which happens a lot in my work, and there's a little bit of play metafictionally, which just means it's about writing and books. Uh, and it's really fun. totalmente immerso in questa questione. It's a it's a mess, but it's a hopefully it's a fun mess. This this book has follows two characters back and forth, kind of ping pong. È l'inizio ideale per un festival che ha come tema il domani dei classici. C'è una storia. But and this this new one has five characters, so it's at, it's pretty demanding of a reader, I think. But I hope once you get engaged in all five uh -huh. narratives, you'll be interested to see how they intersect. Okay. Thank you so much. Grazie a tutti.